Hamilton Arts Council serves communities within the Greater Hamilton area and the traditional territories upon which it sits, including Ancaster, Dundas, Flambrough, Glambrook, Hamilton, Stony Creek, Waterdown, and Six Nations of the Grand River. We acknowledge that the area we serve is situated upon the tradi traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Hamilton continues to be home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, North America. And we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. I'm going to turn the session over to today's presenters, visiting us from Working Culture, Diane Davey and Brianne D'Angelo. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, David. And hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Brianne D'Angelo, and I am the Marketing and Communications Manager for Working Culture. Um, as David mentioned, I'm joined by my colleague, Diane Davey, who is Working Culture's Executive Director. Our presentation today is Welcome to Working Culture. Working Culture's offices and core team are located in Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We encourage you to take the time to also reflect on where you are, the land that you work and reside on, and the individuals who came before you and are contributors and protectors of that land. In today's presentation, we will cover who work in culture is, what we do, and the resources that we offer to support artists, creatives, and cultural workers across Canada. Um, so just a quick housekeeping note before we begin. As David mentioned, we have a Q&A session at the end of our kind of formal presentation, and Diane and I are looking forward to answering your questions at that time. All right, thank you, everybody. And now I'm gonna turn things over to Diane. Thank you, Brianne, and thank you, everyone, for, uh, for attending today, and thank you to the Hamilton Arts Council for inviting us. Um, we want to talk to you about um, who uh, working culture is, and maybe that should be a, a both a, a who and a what. Uh, and if we, if we deal with the what, next slide, please, Brianne. Um, we are a nonprofit. We've been around since 1997, so we have longevity and history. Uh, and we serve the broad arts and culture sector. Our vision is an inclusive arts, culture, and creative sector that contributes to the economic and social well-being of our communities. The two pillars that we use extensively uh, in, in attracting funding uh, are that economic and the social well-being, uh, with, I think, for us, social well-being, particularly post-pandemic, a little bit outweighing the economic at this point. Next slide, please. Um, our mission is to support the, the professional lives of artists, creatives, and cultural workers and the organizations that support and engage them through skills development, research, and career resources. So who, who is that really? It's, it's individual artists from all disciplines. It's both nonprofit uh, art service organization and uh, the for-profit cultural industries. Uh, so it, it, it's a big group. Next slide. And just to kind of get a little bit more into the scope of what the culture sector that we serve is, we want to talk about what it embraces from, from our interpretation. Next slide, please, Brianne. Uh, it's, it's broad uh, and uh, it includes what we traditionally think of as the arts of so visual arts, literary arts, performing arts, uh, and music and the like. So all of, all of that. Uh, and it also includes museums and heritage. And it includes uh, the cultural industries, so that's book publishing, magazine publishing, film, television, interactive, uh, and, and music, and libraries. Uh, in truth, we don't do a lot for libraries. We tend to have quite specialized training, but we've often partnered with them to deliver community training and, uh, and, and obviously anything of a business nature that might be appropriate for, for their staff too. Uh, it's a vibrant uh, sector. Uh, and um, it's a, and it's a big sector. Next slide, please. 
uh, in uh, in 2019, just before the pandemic hit, we did a major uh, major uh, uh, labor market uh, insights um, report, research and report. And in Ontario, and that is the the uh, predominant focus of, of what we serve. Although we acknowledge that digitally we we are national, um, several of the services we offer are, are purely digital and are accessed by people across the country in the sector. But if, if we're going out into the community, we restrict ourselves to the Ontario uh, perspective, uh, and that's over 274,000 artists, creatives, and cultural workers. So as I say, a big sector. Uh, we're larger than uh, you know mining and agriculture and the like, although often not presented quite that way in the, in, in the politics. Um, we serve uh, all ages. Uh, we sort of say 19 plus because we don't really specialize in, in younger students, although we have occasionally done presentations and the like, uh, and at all stages of their career from emerging through to, to senior artists. Uh, and it's, it's a big group, but our focus is, is quite pinpointed. It's really around those entrepreneur, entrepreneurial and business skills that help um, artists and organizations sustain themselves, grow, uh, and, uh, and, and increase their, you know, their quality of life, their employment stability, um, and work-life balance. And we're, we aim to be uh, ever more inclusive, equitable, um, to uh, address uh, underrepresented groups uh, in the work that we do. <clears throat> we, we partner a lot in what we do, and we're always uh, uh, seeking uh, partnerships that help us with our, our delivery, our development and delivery of business leadership and management skills. Uh, the, the, I'll just add that the, um, the sector has been um, hit by uh, COVID well, we were almost the first out, um, and particularly the performing arts. And the performing arts, so that's you know music, theater, um, really are still struggling. Uh, getting our uh, audiences back is, is going to be an ongoing issue over the next several years. So I encourage you to get out in your community and go see things. Um, now, next slide, please, Graham. Circling back to the, uh, to the who, we serve a big sector, but we're not a big team. We are these five people. So um, I, I mentioned partnering. We partner a lot because there's no way that we, our organization can do everything we need. And a lot of people are doing skills training. Um, so our, our kind of criteria is we tend to focus on what we call common and critical um, uh, business and entrepreneurial skills when we're, uh, we're delivering something under the purely uh, working culture uh, brand. Uh, but if we're getting into a discipline specific, we've done a lot of work with music, for example, then we would work with a partner uh, and, uh, and they would be the experts in helping us identify people and, and, uh, and, and communicating with that sector. Um, but the skills tend to remain fairly similar. Uh, they're just adapted to suit the needs of, of specific audiences. Uh, and the next slide, part of our team, it's not just staff, we have a wonderful board uh, and um, they're, they're volunteers. They provide the check and balance uh, in, our, in our governance. And uh, they're our community champions. And we work hard to make sure that they, they, they're representative of the community and inclusive in terms of everything from discipline uh, to backgrounds. Uh, so they're, they're part of the team. And with that, I am turning it back over to Brianne. Thanks, Diane. Um, so we're going to get into what working culture does. Uh, so we have three core services of skills development, research and career resources, um, which we provide to artists, creatives and cultural workers, as well as to the organizations that support and engage them. So skills development, uh, we'll start here. Working culture develops and delivers programming for cultural workers across all arts disciplines and cultural industries and across different career levels. We host in-person and online professional development, learning opportunities and training, most often focused on business planning, entrepreneurship skills, organizational capacity and management. Most of our programming is free for participants to access. So I'm gonna share an overview of um, the professional development programs that we currently have on the go. So working with local champions in Windsor and surrounding communities, we are currently delivering a free training series called Growing Creative Careers to support the career and skills development of arts and culture professor, or professionals sorry, in Windsor, Essex. 
The training includes workshops, access to online resources and local experts, and facilitated peer mentoring. We are adapting and delivering the program in four cohorts for the Windsor-Essex Creative Community, working closely with partners at the Arts Council, the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Centre, and the City of Windsor. The program was originally planned for hybrid delivery, so in-person and virtual, with participants having access to exclusive e-learning content. However, because the program launched in 2020, the first two cohorts were delivered fully virtually with access to e-learning. So each cohort topic or focus responds directly to needs expressed by the community. The, so the first was focused on emerging and early career arts professionals affected by the pandemic. And the second cohort on building better boards was for arts organizations looking to improve their governance, including through the lens of equity, diversity, and inclusion. We are currently delivering cohort three, planning your projects, which is focused on project planning for artistic and creative projects. And this cohort is being delivered both virtually and with some in-person sessions. In 2023, we'll, we will deliver cohort four, the final one, and begin to develop resources that we can share more widely after the program ends. FLEX, or the Festival's Learning Exchange Program, is another free training series that we developed and delivered through 2021 and 2022. Uh, which was focused on collaboration strategies among arts and heritage festivals. So helping festivals in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic by providing a space where they could come together, share skills and knowledge, and also form and implement effective collaboration strategies with other festivals in our core delivery communities of Toronto, Kingston, Ottawa, and Sudbury. This was a pilot program. Uh, the training was fully virtual and we delivered it to a core group of cohort participants um, who also received access to e-learning resources and community specific sessions in each of the delivery communities. We also offered a series of what we called flex spotlight sessions, um, which were open to the general public as well as the core participants. We are currently developing resources from this program that we'll be able to share more widely online. Um, and uh, our program manager, Steph Draker, and the project facilitator, Fanny Martin, actually recently shared some early learnings from Flex at the Spark Symposium in October. So they were talking about how to make that shift from competition to collaboration and how artists and producers can find common ground and create strong and mutually beneficial collaborations with peers and partners. So we're really looking forward to sharing more resources from this program in 2023. Um, this is a recently completed program, Marketing Masterclass. So Marketing Masterclass was an intensive training series that we developed for arts and heritage professionals who wanted to develop a specific marketing strategy for their organization. We originally planned to deliver Marketing Masterclass in person with access to e-learning. However, if you look at that start date there again, you'll see that we quickly had to pivot and convert the program to a nine part series of virtual sessions for each delivery community of Toronto, Kingston and Ottawa. Uh, with the goal of providing training to support the marketing strategy development of each participant. And to this, we added two additional sessions that brought all of the participants together to dive deeper into specific topics that were crowdsourced by the groups. So participants came to the program interested in developing strategies for a range of product uh, project ideas, sorry, including creating new social media campaigns, launching a new program or event, reaching new audiences. Uh, there was also marketing strategy development for a couple of new website launches. We had 32 participants overall, 17 from Toronto, six from Kingston and nine from Ottawa. 
And an additional in-person uh, workshops, networking, webinar sessions reached an additional 37 participants. This program topic really responded to challenges faced by organizations at the height of the pandemic. It allowed for participants to explore how to pivot strategically with peers located in their region and to also learn more about what was happening in other communities. I mentioned in the previous programs that after the live elements of a professional development series are complete, we will create resources and other further materials from the program that will then share widely with our communities online. And so for Marketing Masterclass, we have produced a series of toolkits, case studies, and participant interviews, um, which are all currently available on our website. If you would like to check them out, uh, we've included the link there on your screen. And so that brings us to our second core service of research. And with that, I will hand the presentation back over to Diane. Thank you. Um, so as you can see, we do active development and delivery of programming, responding to community need, and we work extensively uh, throughout Ontario and we work with partners. We also back up what we do and inform what we do through uh, research. Um, our research tends to be a bit opportunistic based on funding available, uh, but what we're really aiming to do is looking at uh, the trends, uh, priorities. Obviously, our focus is on skills uh, and skills gaps. Uh, we we all are always looking to highlight uh, the impact of this sector uh, on, on society and the economy. Uh, and uh, we're constantly looking to hone what's needed, uh, what, what the community is telling us they need in terms of business skills and where there are uh, training gaps and priorities. Um, we, we always, people sometimes say to me, well, aren't business skills, business skills, aren't there lots of business colleges? And yeah, there are in business programs, but not that many specifically aimed at the arts. And I think what we bring to it, uh, and we found this from the research, is um, a respect for our community and uh, an understanding of where they start, what they need. Um, so they're, they're, they're safe places for, for dialogue and uh, we encourage conversations. Uh, we, we always uh, ask uh, the sector itself what they th feel is needed. Uh, and our research reports are all on our, uh, our website. So uh, there's a research tab and uh, we're working uh, at uh, in increasing that over the next little while. Some current uh, research, next slide please, uh, Brian. The most current uh, report is navigating a career in the arts for newcomers. Uh, and it's up on the website. We did this uh, report um, about a year ago and we are building on it. Um, many newcomer artists are directed away from the arts because their first point of contact is often settlement houses that don't really understand the arts. So the, the, the old story about new artists basically being told to get a job at, uh, at McDonald's because there are no jobs in the arts. But we disabuse people of that and we try to develop a pathway. We're building on this research project with a implementation project, which um, it, it's basically the same sort of focus. Uh, and that's building out the resources, working with settlement houses and uh, other arts organizations um, that are uh, focused on, on interface with, with new Newcomers. Uh, and uh, as I say, we share this with, uh, with our funder partners and with the community at large. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the report I uh, alluded to as having been published just before the pandemic, our big labor market insights is called Making It Work. And it was a major project that looked at uh, Ontario broadly and looked at, uh, at what were pathways towards sustainable careers, what skill sets did people need, what were the priorities. And we've been using the results of that uh, since that time uh, to hone what we do. We're also hoping, we worked with the Ministry of Culture actually on this one, and we're hoping that they might have funding it's a, it's a if um, in 2014 to pick it up again and do a similar report that would show the, uh, the sector post pandemic. So then we'd have a snapshot before and after, which I think would be very interesting for all concerned. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Brianne. Thanks, Diane. Um, so we'll, we'll touch now on uh, the resources that Working Culture offers. So Working Culture is here to support and encourage artists, creatives, and all cultural workers to strive for success, whatever that might mean to each individual person. 
We connect job seekers with employers and we provide a platform for sharing professional development opportunities across Canada. Our resources also highlight success stories from the sector, hiring best practices, and conversations on living, working, and thriving in arts and culture. Working Cultures Job Board is a platform where organizations can post all types of paid positions that are relevant and of interest to arts and cultural workers. In fact, it is the number one job board for artists, creatives, and cultural workers in Ontario with over 1,700 jobs posted each year. We find that many people who engage with working culture first do so through the job board, whether they are a job seeker and looking for employment in arts and culture or an employer looking to post and fill a position. The Discovery Board is a sister to the job board. Um, it's a platform where the arts and culture community can post workshops, collaboration opportunities, conferences, call for submissions, volunteering positions, and much more. Um, and before we move to our next set of resources, I thought I would just share a few quick facts from our 2021 job board trend report. Um, so in 2021, there were approximately 1,740 jobs posted on the job board from across Canada. There were positions posted in 12 provinces and territories, and uh, we saw remote positions trending upwards. Most organizations that posted in 2021 indicated that their discipline is in the arts. So dance, music, theater, visual arts, media arts, and literary arts as well as interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and emerging art forms. Most posters were looking to fill full-time positions, so 30 hours or more, a permanent employee on salary. Um, most positions posted in 2021 focused on administrative work rather than just creative work, although a combination of creative work and administrative work was also high. Most positions posted were inter intermediate positions, which includes administrators and coordinators and managers. Um, most posts were for positions located in Ontario with a major cluster in Toronto. And most positions provided a salary rather than an hourly rate. So if you are trying to find or fill a position in the arts and culture sector, our Working Culture Success Stories podcast shares advice for job seekers and employers on how to secure a position as an artist, creative, or cultural worker, and on how to attract qualified candidates. It is a 12 episode series with conversations on things like remote work and working from home, um, the challenges of switching careers, how to connect the, the dots from one job to another with transferable skills, uh, the, the career trajectory of an arts administrator, finding work as an emerging cultural worker, career paths to leadership in the arts and much more. Hustle and Thrive is another 12 part podcast series produced by Working Culture, uh, which is focused on conversations about living, working and thriving in arts and culture. It is co-hosted by our program manager, Stephanie Draker, and our former marketing coordinator, Yomi John. They have discussions about equity, value, and impact of cultural products with artists, creators, culture contributors, and supporters to learn about their work and uh, unique creative experiences. This podcast series answers questions and has discussions around how to make the arts and culture sector reflective around issues of equity. It's a space for ideas that impact creative work and the creative community. Some of the episodes have conversations about accessibility, um, the power of storytelling, DIY projects, engaging without tokenism, shaping your passion into a career, and support systems in the creative process. And finally, uh, we have two workshop and webinar series that are available to view on our website, Creative Boost 
and work smarts. So Creative Boost is a working culture program for folks working in arts, culture, libraries, and heritage that teaches skills related to business planning and entrepreneurship. So subject examples include like marketing strategy, uh, financial forecasting, e-commerce, etc. Um, we do have Creative Boost webinar recordings available to watch on demand on our website. And some of these webinars have focused on topics like um, the transition to self-employment as an artist or arts administrator, uh, personal stories on business planning from creative entrepreneurs, and using the four stages of the marketing funnel to get your message heard and increase audience reach. Work Smarts is also for folks working in arts, culture, libraries, and heritage and teaches skills related to organizational capacity and management. So here, example subjects include um, financial management, human resources, uh, capacity building, strategic planning, project management, copyright, customer service, inclusion and diversity, et cetera. Um, Work Smart webinar recordings are also available to watch on our website on demand. Um, and some of the recent topics include fundraising for small organizations and returning to or reopening an office space during the pandemic for small companies in the creative and cultural industries. And of course, in addition to um, the resources that we offer directly, there are a lot more organizations out there uh, that provide support. And uh, Diane will speak to this, uh, these additional resources. Thanks, Brianna. And just before I move on to that, I want to comment, uh, Brianna has uh, sort of focused on it, but, but to underscore, the job board itself is an incredible resource, even if you're not looking for a job. If you're hiring, it can give you insights into what people are paying. We, we um, quite a while ago, instituted people have to put uh, salary ranges in, something that we've learned from uh, our research. Uh, that one of the most irksome things that people find when they're job hunting is having to guess at what people are paying. So we've actually instituted there, there are ranges. So if you're on the hiring side, it can be a great way to see what kind of skills are related to what kind of position uh, and what kind of, uh, of uh, salary ranges might there be. Uh, and, uh, and you can see where they are geographically, uh, for example. So it, it's, it's a great resource. Uh, and we're actually in the process of um, a, a big exercise in upgrading our website uh, and uh, we're doing research we're in the research needs assessment stage uh, and we're going to roll out with the idea that it will be um, more functional more user friendly uh, easier to search and the like while retaining the simplicity and elegance of the current board um, but one of the things going forward I'm hoping will emerge is the ability to um, basically do analytics uh, more quickly I was, we aren't quite there yet, but uh, but so that you could say, oh, you know, I'm posting for a marketing manager and I can do a filter. That's one of the top three skills people are asking for and the like. Uh, and also coming out of our needs assessment is we want to do, I think, more um, uh, training around best practices in job posting, interviewing, recruiting, and the like. It is It has changed, as we know, over the last while um, to be a very job seekers market. Uh, and people are struggling and struggling in the arts to retain, to, to attract and retain people uh, with, uh, with, with particularly, you know, strong with digital and soft skills. So what we'd like to do is be able to help that make those matches a, a little bit, uh, a little bit easier uh, if we could possibly do so and, and make and automate some of it. So uh, next slide, please. But it's not just about us, as Brianne says. There are lots and lots of organizations, including the Hamilton Arts Council, uh, certainly a wonderful resource for those of you in the, in the area. Um, and, and there are lots more. So we've kind of grouped this slide and there are links on it. We will share all of this after the fact. So uh, it, all of you who attend can, can see it. And I think, David, that you're, you're actually broadcasting after the fact too. Yeah, so, so we'll, we'll, I was gonna say, we'll send, be sending out the slides uh, with to everyone who's registered for the link, if, if that's excellent. okay with you. Excellent, yes, no, absolutely. That's, that's what we're here for, to provide the information. So roughly, and these aren't by any, this is not by any means exhaustive. So we group them into funders, those all important funders, and funders tend to group into federal, 
um, provincial and municipal and being aware and private too. There's, there's private foundations and the like if you're a charity uh, that, that can support too. Uh, and uh, and I and I know that David has done some uh, training around grantsmanship or getting grants, the tips on getting grants, and uh, it's a very important skill to have if uh, if you are in the sector. Uh, there are um, also provincial arts service organizations, um, many of which tend to focus on on specific disciplines. So Carfac, for example, is for visual artists. It publishes a very good um, chart of fees that uh, they recommend people pay artists for various kinds of services. It's something that working culture adheres to. So when we're getting speakers and the like, uh, we use that as our, as our kind of our guideline. Uh, and it ranges from Craft Ontario, which is all about makers, Music Ontario, all about music, Ontario galleries. I mean, you can see they tend to be uh, self-evident and, um, and brands have got a selection of them across both the uh, the more artsy type part of the sector as well as the, the um, uh, as the cultural industries part. And there are, there are, they tend to go down to art service organization, which tends to be the nonprofit on the uh, uh, cultural industry side. They tend to be what are called trade associations. So they're membership groups that support various pro um, uh, disciplines from book publishing to magazine publishing to film Ontario and the like. Uh, so depending on what your discipline is, you may want to do a little research and kind of get an idea of who else out there might be support because they, they, they do wonderful things. Um, there are national oriented ones in addition to the, the provincial ones and, so, and there's often like Carfax for instance as Carfax Ontario and it has a national organization too. There are the unions like ACTRA uh, and the writers union alike uh, and, um, and as you can see they, they once again they support from visual artists for Carfax down to the Association of Canadian Publishers which is a for-profit uh, publishing house as part of my background. Um, there are entrepreneurship organizations. We're not the only ones offering uh, assistance. Uh, the Hamilton Arts Council does, uh, and uh, there are a variety of them. We've just listed a couple of them here and a bunch of other organizations. One other organization that I was mentioning that we didn't list that I was mentioning to David, because I know you're doing something on sponsorship, is an organization called Business Slash Arts. It used to be Business for the Arts. They changed their name. I don't know why, but anyway, the slash is now instead of Business for the Arts, it's Business Arts. They have a program which I believe has been refunded called Arts Fest which actually um, has a matching program uh, for people who are, are getting into sponsorship. Uh, we've used it in past and I, I can highly recommend it. It also uh, provides mentorship around sponsorship. Um, so just, just another, um, another option. And we are doing quite well on this. So I'm glad because we wanted to leave uh, a fair bit of time for questions. And um, we're going to open it up now for questions from anybody. Ask us anything. Gosh, thank you so much. I'm processing everything that everything that uh, that you <laughs> that you've shared, but I really appreciate it because otherwise I could go to the website and go down all sorts of rabbit holes. But you've given me a real sense of the sorts of things that I would be looking for um, specifically on behalf of HAC. I wanted to jump in actually with a question and um, sort of get your uh, your opinion your, on your perspective. The the resources that you have have. Are there examples of um, maybe some of those surveys or reports being used in advocacy work by, organ by other oh, yes. organizations? Yes, definitely. The Making It Work um, uh, report was heavily uh, used in almost everybody's advocacy. And, and our stuff is all public, so you, you can use it. Uh, and uh, it's, it, it, it is a broad survey of the sector, and it used a very interesting uh, approach um, it really looked at rather than sort of, they often do research, this gets a bit technical, so I won't go on about it, but doing full-time equivalents and they sort of make, it isn't a real person, it's, a, it's made up hours. This one focused on actual people. So it's sort of a head count kind of thing. Uh, and it confirms a lot of things that we know, and it'll be very interesting to see if we can get, do it again, whether it, it, it remains the same. You know, a lot of gig work, a lot of people doing more than, people in the arts tend to do more than one thing. Uh, you know, I do work in culture and I consult. I mean, it's, everybody seems to have more than one gig, um, and the difficulty of piecing those things together in a, in a, you know, making a life out of it. Um, but also the robustness and the variety and the, you know, the, the scope of the sector and how much it contributes to the social well-being uh, of of communities. I mean, people 
don't necessarily go to a place to, I guess some people do, to look at the steel mill. You know, they, they go because there's a really great festival or, you know, some, some sort of performing arts or theater or something. So, yeah, uh, so yes, it's, it's, um, it's used as a, an advocacy tool to underpin relationships. We are not primarily an advocacy organization, but we participate in organizations that are. So I'm part of PESO, which is the Provincial Arts Service Organization Coalition. Uh, and they, they're, they're about advocacy. I know they use the report. Um, and there are another, a number of other advocacy organizations or organizations that do advocacy on, a, on an ongoing basis. And we, we work with them and our material is all open for them to use. And we, we encourage people to use it. We have, we have quite a broad reach uh, in part because of the job board. So we get like more than 100,000 visitors a month. Or am I saying that right, Bran? <laughs> yeah, close to. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, we we often spread messages uh, and mm -hmm. amplify other people's messaging too. Fantastic. Thank you so much for for that. That's really useful. I was wondering how, um, and I, perhaps I missed it at the beginning. So individuals and organizations wanting to uh, wanting to interact with working culture, obviously they can um, can they visit the website and uh, and engage with the resources sort of um, is there is there a, is there a membership is there a sign up is there um, or is or is there even a newsletter that people can sign up to to kind of get updated? definitely a newsletter yeah. perfect <laughs> Yes, we do have a monthly newsletter uh, that we send out typically at the beginning of each month and that will offer kind of a roundup of of projects that we're working on currently what's coming up. Uh, we also share news and amplify stories from the arts and culture sector more widely. Um, so I can probably find the link to it and put it in the chat or we can include it uh, as part of the package that goes out to participants after the session. Um, we're also on social media, so we share and post about uh, what we're doing on um, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, those are kind of our major communities, uh, as well as like the website in addition to the newsletter. Um, but yeah, as, as you were kind of asking about whether or not there's um, like a membership tier or if you have to sign up to receive information about various programs, it's all, for the most part, it's free. Um, if you're participating in a program, there will be resources that are kind of like, specific to participants in the program um, but we do create materials or kind of like um, coalesce those materials into packages that we share like widely after the program has finished um, kind of like with marketing masterclass which I mentioned earlier so coming out of that program we've shared uh, packages of um, kind of toolkits and like worksheets that were produced for program participants and now like if you went to the website, you could download them, you could go through the worksheets, you could kind of go through that process of creating a marketing strategy for your organization on your own. So we're very much about sharing information, sharing resources, sharing that kind of knowledge base with people within the community. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I, yes, I know I'm going to be going to the website uh, <laughs> after this session. Um, I'm going to open the floor for uh, to any questions from anyone who's in the meeting day, you can either raise your hand or you can pop your question in the chat and we'll uh, put that to either Diane or Brianne. Uh, Megan has her hand raised, so I'm gonna invite Megan to ask her question. Thanks, David. Yes, um, hi, Brianne and Diane, I have two questions. Um, th the first is in relation to your programming. You have a lot of really important programming, um, which I'll also be looking at your website to get caught up on. and. I was wondering if you have specific programs or workshops that are catered to um, certain demographics, like maybe an age, an age range, range, um, or as you mentioned, um, artists slash creatives that are emerging or professionals, et cetera. Do you have programming that's specific towards certain categories there, um, or if it's more so uh, general um, and anyone can attend any of your programming? Um, I'll field that one if you like. Um, it, we are like many nonprofits dependent on project funding. So mm -hmm. our programming tends to be quite specific at any given time. So um, 
we, we rarely have things that are age limits, but we do sometimes deliberately go for a more, you know, emerging category of artist or a more intermediate or, or experienced. You'll also note from just the ones that Brianne covered, in some instances, we're working with partners in specific geographic regions and we're responding to um, what, uh, what, what they want and what they're looking for. It's not that, I mean, I don't think we would have not let somebody outside the Windsor Essex into, but we gave priority to the people who were there. We've also done, uh, we didn't get into this because we, we do other stuff. We've done some fee for service work with Brampton and Aaron, where we've developed and adapted programming specifically for those reasons. So once again, there would be a targeted group that we're looking for, but we don't necessarily exclude others participating in at least the virtual ones. If it's in person, then it, it by, by being geographically oriented tends to limit itself to people in, in the area. Um, and, and we have done quite specific, the two streams that uh, Rand was talking about, the uh, Creative Boost and, and uh, Work Smarts, were developed to sort of identify individual artists and the Work Smarts more organizational capacity uh, streams. So we do that kind of thing. Okay. Fantastic. I'm going to invite uh, Kay to unmute and ask that question. Hello there. First of all, I just wanted to thank you for this lovely website, Work and Culture. I have been a fan for many years. I got my, my first organizational teaching experience. I mean, I did teach on my own in Costa Rica. I did a, an acting class, but this is the first time working for an organization. And I work on and off with them since. And I've gotten maybe three or four other companies that I've taught acting, singing, and dance for kids to between 2015 and 2020. So it's been a very, very important part of my life. And I really wanted to thank you for its existence for the job board. And I've learned more about the other areas, which is fantastic and very much recommended this website. So my question is maybe one that's hard to answer. Her. But because of 2020, without going into the details, I started teaching online through a company and now I like it. So I'm going to try an online teaching platform. I do regularly check the website. And my question finally <laughs> is, do you ever see anyone going back to much online teaching? I saw one posting that said you have to stay up until midnight sometimes so that was the closest one i've seen in a long time and schedule wise i have a volunteering from eight to nine every morning so staying up until midnight it kind of isn't really my early bird lifestyle so i was just wondering in the future do you see anyone going back to online or is it in person from here on out mostly um i would say definitely online is here to stay i mean we are we missed the in-person, but we adapted, uh, you know, we, we had to. So we adapted uh, to, to online and it's been successful. I mean, you get, it's greater reach at less expense. Um, it tends to be sporadic. I mean, people, a lot of people sign up for things but don't actually attend. I mean, to be witness today, uh, they may get back and do the recorded version. Uh, I think at the end of the day, hybrid is really, kind of what we're going to be winding up doing. Brianne, do you want to comment too? Um, well, my sense is that although we were we were kind of pivoting to deliver programming online, there were benefits to it, which we will continue to retain as we like move forward. So that most of our programming would probably have a hybrid element going into the future um, because it does allow us to share things like uh, resources very easily and to communicate with people kind of on a more regular basis. Um, although it was really nice, for example, uh, with the Windsor cohort, cohort three, uh, we were able to go and meet people in person for the first time over the summer. And that was really nice because we work with partners in that community. So to meet partners, to kind of go to the places and to meet people where they're working and living. I, I personally found that very valuable in terms of our delivery of the program. Um, but Kay, I wasn't sure, were you, were you kind of asking more about employment? Like, do you, were you thinking about like whether employment would kind of stay 
uh, both virtual and remote, like that kind of thing. Is there, is there a, an email address that that uh, that Kay could follow up with? Mm. Regarding the specific work question, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a general uh, info at workingculture.ca address. Actually, I think it's on our very last slide, but we will include it um, for participants. So if you want to reach out to that uh, email address, then we can direct it to, you know, whoever would be best suited to answer it. So absolutely. Great. Um, I wanted to ask, there are a few, uh, I know there are a few um, groups, organizations and collectives on the call, as well as who will be accessing this resource. Um, I wonder, Diane, in terms of uh, engaging with working culture as a potential partner. Um, I'm very interested in the uh, the infrastructure or the skills that you guys already have in place, particularly in terms of researching and conducting research, for example, in Hamilton, um, when looking at different projects and programs. Is there is there um, is that a case of just contacting working culture directly and saying, I have something I'd like to partner with you on and also um, when looking at something like research for a particular program or project that we might be interested in in running in the city, is there um, is there a level of preparation that we would need to do before coming to you and and saying, hey, we'd like to partner with you? Okay, we we love partnering, and yes, people can get in touch, and they can get in touch with me. We'll include my email. Um, in terms of research. We don't have internal capacity, we hire people. So we, we, attend, we tend to do RFPs and we hire a consultant. Uh, so for example, the, um, that's not, yeah, it is true. Uh, the uh, navigating uh, um, the skill sets for newcomers was done by a great guy called Chris Erickson. And, and uh, we used a firm called Nordicity for the, uh, for the big uh, making it work project. So our, uh, our way of doing research is identifying a project in partnership or on our own, finding the funding, hiring the consultant, uh, then publishing it. One of the things we can do, obviously, is we get it out there in the community, which we really like doing. Um, and if people are interested in exploring something, yeah, I'm happy to talk. I mean, it's and we take it from from you know, okay, what are you interested in? Who's the best lead on it? We don't always have to lead. I mean, other people can be the lead, and we can you know. We find more and more funders seem to like people working in collaboration, which is which makes sense. Uh, so there can be strength in numbers, I guess, would be the, the, the thing. And and we're happy to, to to point to other people who might be helpful in, in something. If it's not us, then maybe somebody else might be. Is, is that answered, David? Yes, absolutely. There was something that you said, I think, before we started the session um, that was about, you know, there really is no need to, to reinvent the wheel. And so yeah. much, so many of the resources exist, so much of the work has been and is being done. Um, and so sessions like this really point people to find, exactly. uh, yeah, either the information exists or at least a starting point. I find that is, is really useful, is looking at some of these, uh, some of the research projects that have been undertaken, looking at some of the questions or sessions that have been offered and thinking even, okay, it gives me inspiration on how to adapt something or how to adapt something to, to my specific area. So, yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, I wanted to, to highlight that and encourage everyone to, to go out from this session, visit the Working Culture website, connect with you guys if they have questions. Um, I think that's all the questions we have in this session. Um, I did want to express my sincere thanks again. And was there, uh, was there a last slide that you wanted to share? Uh, we do have a contact us slide here. Perfect. So this has um, the email address that we mentioned earlier. And thank you to Megan for putting that in the chat. That was great. Uh, there's our website there um, and our social media handles. So we're at Working Culture on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. And we're at workingculture.ca on Instagram. <laughs> the one that's slightly different. Um, and if you go to our website, you can also sign up for our newsletter uh through there as well but um we'll put we'll put a direct link in with the, the post attendee package I'll, I'll mention one resource we didn't mention um but since we've got a minute or two uh that i'll also point out because i know many organizations are very interested in in um, edi uh, initiatives inclusion and diversity and we have uh, something called the inclusion in the creative workplace um toolkit and it's very much designed for smaller organizations 
uh, that uh, like many in the arts. So it, it's uh, it's a couple of years old now, but it, it stands up and uh, we'll be migrating it in some way, shape or form to the new website and like, but it, it's there now if anybody wants uh, some tips about you know how, how you do that effectively and how you deal with your boards and, and that, that sort of thing. Um, 